This is Zenega, it's Johnny here, and today I'm super excited because we are going to go over all of the organic chemistry you need to know for your GCSE chemistry exam. It's going to be organic, gluten-free, vegan. I'm really, really excited for this episode. It's one of the longer episodes we're doing, so let's dive in so we can cover everything as quick as possible. We're starting with crude oil. So what is crude oil? It is a non-renewable, finite resource, which means that it's going to run out. It's not going to last forever. Uh, most compounds in crude oil are hydrocarbons. Now, the clue is in the name. Hydrocarbons are molecules that are made up of only hydrogen and carbon atoms. Hydrocarbons differ in their size, though, and that can change the properties of the hydrocarbon. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Crude oil is found in rocks and is used to produce fuels and other important chemicals. Ooh, it's a mixture of lots of different compounds that are not chemically combined. And most of the compounds in crude oil are hydrocarbons. And hydrocarbons just contain hydrogen and carbon. It is, crude oil is formed from the fossilized, fossilized remains of ancient plankton. How fun is that? Plankton like in SpongeBob SquarePants, I love it. So the two atoms of hydrocarbons are hydrogen and carbon. And it's mainly, it's, uh, to summarize, crude oil is mostly made of hydrocarbons. It's non-renewable and it's found in rocks. Let's talk over the properties of hydrocarbons next. Uh, the size of a hydrocarbon is really important in determining its properties. The properties we need to talk over are viscosity. Viscosity is how thick something is. So think of syrup. Syrup is very viscous. Hydrocarbons with longer chain lengths have higher viscosity, so they're thicker and flow less easily. Hydrocarbons with longer chains are also less flammable, so, flammable, so they don't burn as easily. And hydrocarbons with longer chains have higher boiling points. Okay, so to summarize, hydrocarbons with longer chains have a higher viscosity, they're less flammable, and they have higher boiling points, okay? And where do we find crude oil again? Remember, it's in rocks. That is where we find our crude oil. Right, next, let's go on to talk about alkanes. Alkanes are a very important type of hydrocarbon, and we're gonna go over everything you need to know about alkanes. Now, most of the molecules in crude oil are hydrocarbons, like we know, and most of the hydrocarbons are alkanes. So what's an alkane, I hear you ask? In alkanes, each carbon atom is bonded to four other atoms, um, and that so it can only either, it can either be hydrogen or carbon. Because remember, hy hydrocarbons only contain hydrogen and carbon, and alkenes are a hydrocarbon. We call alkanes saturated as they only contain single bonds with other atoms, and this is because carbon can only make four bonds in total. Alkanes are they're quite react they're quite unreactive, and they don't react much with other stuff but they can burn super well they are on fire um, and that makes them really useful fuel so we love burning alkanes it's great not so great for the environment but we'll get onto that a little bit later bam um, the general formula for an alkane is cnh2n plus two so what does that mean i hear you ask it means that if we were to have six carbon atoms the n would equal six so the formula would be c6 h2 times six plus two um, which would be um, 14. So that is how the general formula works. Um, and we can do it for any number of um, carbon atoms and it's always going to be the same. Um, so it just makes life that little bit easier. And remember, alkanes, they're going to come from um, crude oil. Now, we need to know the four smallest alkanes. And they are methane, which is CH4, ethane, which is C2H6, propane, which is C3H8 and butane, which is C4H10. I would learn the four smallest ones because they're the ones that could come up in your exams. Uh, so it's MEPB, MEPUB, MEPUB. <laughs> Not a great acronym, but it will maybe it will help you. So methane, ethane, propane, and butane are the um, smallest. Um, hydrocarbons. And do remember that general formula for alkanes? It's CnH2n plus 2. Amazing. So quick question, if an alkane contains 21 carbon atoms, what's its formula going to be? Let's use that general formula. We know n is going to be 21, so it's going to be C21, and then to calculate the number of hydrogen atoms, we do we need to use 2n plus 2. So we do 2 times 21, which is 42, and then we add 2, that's 44. So our formula is C21H44. Amazing. Okay, so 
that is a very quick run through of the different types of, um, alka of, of alkanes and the four smallest types. Next, we're going to go over fractional distillation. And we're going to do this in a hyper learning format. It's going to be wild. What is fractional distillation? Well, it is a technique that we use to separate crude oil into groups of hydrocarbons with similar number of carbon atoms. And we call these hydrocarbons fractions. Different size hydrocarbons have different boiling points and fractional distillation separates hydrocarbons using their different sized boiling points. In fractional distillation, crude oil is heated until it evaporates into a vapor. The crude oil vapor is put into the bottom of a fractionating column and it rises upwards. It's moving on up. So let's consolidate that a little bit. Fractional, fractional distillation separates hydrocarbons into fractions containing hydrocarbons of different lengths. And so what does fractional distillation use to separate these fractions? It uses the hydrocarbons different boiling points. And we call each of the groups that crude oil is split up into fractions. Now, in the fractionating column, which is the apparatus we use for fractional distillation, the temperature is highest at the bottom. It's hot at the bottom, honey. And then the temperature gets gradually lower as we go up the column. So the longer the chain of the, of the hydrocarbon, the higher the boiling point it will be. So what does that mean in principle? It means that the long chain hydrocarbons are going to condense, which means we're going to go from a uh, gas to a liquid at the bottom of the column and are collected as liquids because they have higher boiling points. Hence, they condense at a higher temperature. So let's summarize that to make sure it sticks and you guys are feeling really confident about everything. Fractional distillation can be used to separate crude oil into groups of hydrocarbons with similar number of carbon atoms. And those groups are called fractions. Now we've talked about those longer chain hydrocarbons, but we are an all-inclusive, um, this is an all-inclusive episode. Everyone is welcome. So we're going to be talking about those short hydrocarbons too. Now, honey, they have some low boiling points up in here. So they're going to pass up the column and they condense at lower temperatures which is nearer the top. The shorter the chain, the lower the boiling point. This is because less energy is required to convert the chains from liquid to gas. Oh my gosh! Um, so that is how we separate the long and short chain hydrocarbons. So let's go over a question. Um, which of the following statements is true about short chain, shorter chain hydrocarbons? They condense at higher temperatures near the top of the column, they condense at lower temperatures near the bottom of the column. They condense at lower temperatures near the top of the column, or they condense at higher temperatures near the bottom of the fractionating column. Well, we can answer this in a few ways. We know that the temperature is higher at the top of the fractionating column. So we can eliminate some of the answers just by, because they're wrong. They're saying that um, the higher temperatures near the top of the fractionating column, uh-uh, the higher temperatures are at the bottom. We also know that short chain hydrocarbons, they, um, are going to condense at lower temperatures. So we know it's going to be at the lower temperatures near the top of the fractionating column. The fractions of crude oil are collected and processed to create end products such as fuel. So it could be like petrol and diesel. So that's what happens um, when this process is done. So let's go over some facts about fractional distillation to finish off this section. The temperature is highest at the bottom of the column. Long chain hydrocarbons have higher boiling points and short chain hydrocarbons um, have lower boiling points and condense near the top of the fractionating column. Amazing. Okay, so we're done with fractional distillation. It's done. It's gone. Next, we're talking about burning hydrocarbons, because like we just said, um, once we have those fractions, which are groups of hydrocarbons with similar length that have been taken through the fractionating column, um, we, can, we can use them to process, um, to make fuels. So they're processed to make fuels like petrol and diesel. So we're going to go over some different types of combustion. Comb combustion is just a fancy way of saying burning. So when something combusts, it is burning. It's burning up like me in the room I'm in right now. It's super warm. It's super hot. Um, if it's any hot, I'm going to combust. Luckily, I have a fan. That's why when you hear the thwop, it's just a little fan. Burning hydrocarbons. The equation for the combustion burning of hydrocarbons depends on the amount of oxygen that is available. So if there's a lack of oxygen, they are... Um, hydrocarbons burn by incomplete combustion and we make carbon monoxide and the equation for that is 2C plus O2 goes to 2CO. Carbon monoxide is a colourless, odourless, toxic gas and if you're ever renting a house in the future make sure you have a carbon monoxide detector. Your landlord has to include one by law because if we can't smell the gas it's toxic. It could kill you so if your boiler is like a bit crap and not working properly 
because there's not enough oxygen, you make carbon monoxide from incomplete combustion and then it's toxic and it can sadly kill you. Um, and it does that by binding to your hemoglobin. That's a nice little extra fun fact for you. Um, burning with plenty of oxygen, that's what we want. Um, if there's loads of oxygen, we get complete combustion. And we have oxidation of carbon and hydrogen to create carbon dioxide and water and energy is released. Um, so to summarize, we have the complete combustion, which is when there is lots of oxygen. Um, so if you have a Bunsen burner, that's when you have the blue flame. And if there's, a, in, if there's not enough um, oxygen, we have incomplete combustion, which can, can produce carbon monoxide. Don't worry, in the lab, it mainly produces carbon C, which is soot, which is what makes that flame yellow. So three important properties to remember about carbon monoxide. It is odorless, toxic, and colorless. Now, let's talk over those heavy fractions of crude oil. They do not make good fuels because they don't ignite easily. They're just like, don't touch me. I don't want to be burned. I like it. I like how I am. I don't want to be converted into oxygen. Uh, I don't want to be burnt in oxygen and be converted into carbon dioxide and water. Um, and like, they're happy. They're chilling. Heavy fractions of crude oil also have a low volatility. What does volatility mean? Volatility is how easy something evaporates. So they're not very volatile, they don't evaporate easily. An example of something that is very volatile is something like perfume, it evaporates really easy, which is why it smells good. Another important factor or characteristic of heavy fractions is that they have high boiling points. So that's three important things to remember about longer fractions of crude oil. Um, made of like long chain hydrocarbons, they don't ignite easily, they have low volatility, and they have high boiling points. Please, please, please remember those three facts. They're super, super important. So um, we've just talked over some nice facts about burning hydrocarbons. So next we're gonna be talking about cracking and alkenes. So crack again. Um, so what is cracking? What are alkenes? I like, I hope you're as excited as I am <laughs> to go over what these are. Cracking, crackers, different things, but I love crackers. Cracking is the process that breaks down long chain, large hydrocarbons into shorter chain, smaller, more useful molecules. It's an example of a thermal decomposition reaction. And thermal decomposition is endothermic, it requires energy. So there are two types of cracking we need to know about. Firstly, we're going over catalytic cracking, a nice bit of alliteration to get us started. Vaporized heavy hydrocarbons are passed over a hot catalyst and this produces um, alkanes and alkenes. So an example is we'll take hexane, which has six carbons, we pass it over a hot catalyst and this creates butane and ethane. That is catalytic cracking, we need a catalyst. Next, we have steam cracking. Here, vaporized heavy hydrocarbons are mixed with steam in a high temperature environment like the room I'm in. This produces alkenes and alkenes as well. So let's go over decane. So decane has 10 carbons. If we vaporize it and we mix it with steam in a high temperature environment, we're gonna make octane, which is an alkane, and ethene, which is an alkene. Fantastic. So let's summarize which method of cracking uses vaporized heavy hydrocarbons and passes them over a hot catalyst. Clues in the name, it is catalytic cracking. That is what we want. And cracking in general refers to the process where long chain hydrocarbons are broken down into shorter, more useful molecules. That's a really common exam question definition. So make sure you are confident with that and you know it. Next, we're going over the uses of alkenes. So alkenes like alkanes are hydrocarbons, organic compounds made of carbon and hydrogen. If you're wondering what organic means, it just means carbon containing. So what are the uses of alkenes? They are starting materials for chemicals like ethanol. Ethanol is alcohol. And it's, they can also be combined to make polymers. We'll go, we'll go over polymers in a bit more detail a little bit later. But when alkenes combine, alkenes are the monomers, which means one, and they combine to make polymers. And again, those two types of cracking, remember it's catalytic cracking, where we pass the, uh, we vaporize the hydrocarbon and put it over a hot catalyst, and steam cracking, which is when we mix the vaporized hydrocarbon with steam in a high temperature environment. 
um, and it's a thermal decomposition reaction. Please do your best to remember that. I'm repeating it a few times because that helps the information stick in. Okay, so next we're gonna go over alkenes in a little bit more detail because we need to learn a lot about these guys. Um, I love an alkene, okay? So they are hydrocarbons, but they've got a really special functional group. A functional group is just a group that determines the reactivity of a molecule. So the, the functional group in alkenes is C double bond C. So it's a carbon to carbon double bond. So alkenes are a, a homologous series, which is just compounds with the same general formula. And the general formula for alkenes is CNH2N. Do you remember what it is for alkanes? Alkanes is CNH2N um, plus two. So, like, al like we said with alkanes, uh, alkanes were saturated because that carbon is making all of the bonds it can. However, alkenes are unsaturated because they contain a double bond between the carbon atoms, that C double bond C functional group. This means that an alkene contains two fewer hydrogen atoms than the alkene with the same number of carbon atoms. And we can see that from the general formula. Alkene is CNH2N, alkene is CNHN. CN, uh, CNH2N plus two. So an alkene always has two less hydrogens than an alkane. Now this C double bond C functional group is very reactive because it's very electron dense. Um, so there's loads of electrons chilling around that double bond. This means alkenes are more reactive than alkanes, bam. So let's summarize the properties of alkenes. They are more reactive than alkanes. They are unsaturated and they contain a double bond, specifically a C double bond C. That is our functional group. Now, the four shortest alkenes, they are ethene, which is C2H4, propene C3H6, butene C4H8, and pentene C5H10. Fantastic. So those are the shortest alkenes. So we've gone over in principle what alkenes are, but oh, there's more, there's more. Chemistry just loves reactions. So we are gonna go over the reactions of alkenes next. Let's summarize a little bit. A functional group, what was that, do you remember? It's a group of atoms that determines how an organic compound will react. And in alkenes, it's that C double bond C. And one of the key reactions that alkenes do is an addition reaction. And in these reactions, the carbon to carbon bond opens up to allow new atoms to bind to the carbons. Again, like I said, this is all inclusive. Everyone's welcome. So alkenes is just like, hey, you're welcome. I'm going to open up this double bond and give this new atom a hug. We're going to make a new bond. Addition reaction. Um, so this, that is the type of reaction that alkenes undergo. And specifically, it's when that double bond opens up, allowing new atoms to bond. An example of this is the addition reaction of an alkane, of sorry, of an alkene with steam. Um, so in the presence of a phosphoric acid catalyst, very important that you remember that, um, and water in the form of steam, we can add water to the alkene to give an alcohol. So ethene, C2H4, plus steam, H2O, goes to ethanol, C2H5OH. Ethanol is an alcohol. We'll be talking more about those next. Alkenes can also undergo addition reactions with halogens. And this is really, really important because it gives us a test to differentiate between alkenes and alkanes. Alkanes saturated can't um, undergo addition reactions. So we can use bromine water, which you've probably seen in the lab. It's like a cute little orange, like tango, but don't drink it, it's bad for you. And it's um, what we do with the bromine water is when you mix it with an alkene, that double bond can open up and react with the bromine in an addition reaction to form dibro to form a dibromo uh, um, compound. So if we take ethene, which is colourless, and we mix it with bromine water, which is orangey brown, it forms dibromoethane, which is colourless. So when we shake an alkene with bromine water, the solution goes from orange brown to colorless you need to say colorless um, don't you won't get the mark for clear you've got to say it's a colorless solution however an alkane if we mix an alkane with bromine water the solution will stay orange because that alkane it's saturated it can't react with the bromine it's like you know what? i'm happy the way i am i've worked years on myself to be happy with who i am so i'm not going to react with you sorry bromine i'm fine so that's what the alkane is saying to the bromine when we add it. Um, alkanes, they are lone wolves. They just want to be burned. That's all they want. They just want to be burned. Um, we can also have alkenes and oxygen. Alkenes react with oxygen in combustion reactions. So honey, we're burning up again. 
bam. And they react in similar ways to um, other hydrocarbons. So if we have ethene reacting with oxygen, um, we can we make carbon di carbon monoxide, carbon and water. Um, and this is because their combustion is incomplete. So alkenes burn with a smoky flame. Um, the simple equation for that reaction would be C2H4 plus O2 goes to CO plus C plus water. Finally, we're going to go over alkenes and hydrogen in the presence of a nickel catalyst. Remember, so alkenes and hydrogen is a nickel catalyst. Hydrogens can be, hydrogen can be added to an alkene to give an alkane. So this is like the reverse of cracking. So ethene plus hydrogen goes to ethane. So ethene C2H4 plus hydrogen H2 goes to ethane C2H6. Adding hydrogen atoms across a carbon to carbon double bond is called hydrogenation. So this is also used um, in when we make margarine, we use hydrogenation because we add hydrogen atoms to a carbon to carbon double bond. Um, so those are the key reactions of um, alkenes. And the key thing that I would say you need to remember is the different catalysts we need. So for alkenes to react with water in the form of steam, we need the phosphoric acid catalyst. Whereas for alkenes and hydrogen, we need a nickel catalyst. Make sure you remember that. It gets examined so much. Um, and it's just cute little catalysts to remember. Catalysts, they lower that activation energy and they just make that reaction nice and easy. We love it. We love a catalyst. Um, so what is the catalyst that we need to react alkenes with hydrogen? Honey, that is nickel. We need a nickel catalyst, okay? So those are the key reactions of alkenes we're going to go over. Next, we're going to talk over alcohols. So what are alcohols? Well, they are organic compounds. So organic contain carbon, but they have the OH functional group, and we call that OH a hydroxyl group. And the general formula for the alcohol homologous, a little hard word to say, the general formula for the homologous series of alcohols is CnH2n plus 1OH. So again, that functional group, we call it a hydroxyl group, and it's we write it as an OH. Now let's go over the four smallest alcohols. You should have been expecting this because we did the four smallest alkenes and alkanes, and you'll notice that the prefixes are, um, they repeat themselves. So it's not actually too much to learn. So the smallest alcohol is methanol, which is CH3OH. Then we have ethanol, then propanol, and then butanol with four carbons. So those are the four shortest alcohols. Methanol, ethanol, propanol, and butanol. Do we remember that general formula for alcohols? I'm sure we do. It's CNHN2N plus 1OH. Bam! Okay, so we've gone over the general principles of um, alcohols. Um, but what are we going to do next? Well, I am glad you asked. We're going to go over alcohol reactions. Are you ready for this? Are you pumped? I'm so excited. What are the reactions of alcohol? So again, we're talking so much about combustion in this episode. Um, so we're not going to stop now. We're going to keep going. We're just getting hotter and hotter. Um, air and heat. When we when alcohols react with air and heat, they produce carbon dioxide and water in a complete combustion reaction. So. Let's go over methanol. So if we were to burn methanol, which is CH3OH, with oxygen O2, we would produce carbon dioxide CO2 and water H2O. When alcohols react with sodium, they produce hydrogen, another important reaction to remember. When alcohols react with a strong oxidizing agent, they produce a carboxylic acid, which we'll be talking about next. And when alcohols are added to water, they dissolve to give a neutral solution. So four cute little reactions you need to remember about um, alcohols. It's with water, they dissolve to give neutral solutions. With sodium, they produce hydrogen. With the strong oxidizing agents, alcohols will produce a carboxylic acid. And when they react with air and heat, um, they, the alcohol will burn or combust to produce carbon dioxide and water. Now we're going to talk about fermentation. Honey, we're going to get yeasty up in here. Um, the process of fermentation involves adding yeast to a sugar sh solution and the resulting reaction yields an aqueous solution of ethanol and carbon dioxide and fermentation is a really common method for producing ethanol and ethanol is a key component of alcoholic drinks so fermenting grapes produces wine but we've got to add in some yeast in there or if you don't like it's also used um to produce other um alcohol based beverages by fermenting that sugar so conditions for um, the fermentation of sugar using yeast are a temperature of 37 degrees Celsius, not too hot or the yeast is going to die. It's going to be like, oh no, it's too hot in here. 
Um, this the solution needs to be slightly acidic, so the pH is going to be below seven, and it's going to be anaerobic, no oxygen up in here. We don't want any oxygen. So there's three conditions for fermentation that you need to remember are a temperature of 37 degrees Celsius, a slightly acidic solution, and it needs to be anaerobic, no oxygen, okay? So those are the key reactions of alcohol that we need to know about, okay? And it's how we produce wine. So we mentioned, we, uh, we mentioned carboxylic acids. So now we're going to dive into even more detail about them. What are they? They are organic, uh, organic compounds that contain a carboxyl group, and that carboxyl group is COOH. And they have the following properties. The, so carboxylic acid properties are, they partially ionize in water, um, meaning that they are weak acids. Partially ionized just means they, um, they form an ion in water. Um, that's what ionize means. The general formula is CnH2n plus 1 COOH. And the functional group is that carboxyl group, the C double bond OH. So, um, Let's go into a little bit more detail about carboxylic acids by going over the four smallest ones. Don't you love it? Did you see this coming? Are you, are you guys seeing the trend? So we have methanoic acid, which has the formula HCOOH, with one carbon, ethanoic acid with two carbons, um, and then we're going to have uh, propanoic acid with three and butanoic acid with four carbons. Amazing. So again, you just need to learn those suffixes once um, and then you'll remember them forever and it'll be great. Now let's go over the reactions of carboxylic acids. When carboxylic acids react with carbonates, they produce salt, carbon dioxide, and water. Um, when carboxylic acids react with water, they dissolve to give an acidic solution. Remember, they partially ionize in water. Alcohols and an acid catalyst. When carboxylic acids react with alcohols using an acid catalyst, they produce an ester and water. So ethanoic acid plus ethanol will give ethyl ethanoate plus water. Um, so that is an ester reaction. You just need to be aware that that reaction can occur. And esters, they're what we use in perfumes. They smell super good. The one you made in class probably smelled like pear drops, um, unless uh, chemistry has progressed since uh, my time in high school. Um, so that was a very quick run through of uh, carboxylic acids. Next, um, we are going to go over polym polymers, okay? So I love, I love me some polymers. I just love, like polymers, the monomers join together. It's all about solidarity and friendship, and it's really nice. So let's go over it. We're starting with addition polymerization, which is when we join short chain monomers to produce one long chain polymer. So monomers, alkenes are the monomers that are used in addition polymerization. This is because alkenes can open up their carbon to carbon double bond to join together. So cute. In addition polymerization, the polymer is the only product, just one product. This this means that the repeating unit has exactly the same atoms as the monomer. Oh my god. So, what are the monomers in addition polymerization? They are alkenes. Remember, addition polymerization, alkenes. And the monomers are the alkene that combine to make the polymer. So, for example, if we have ethene and it undergoes addition polymerization, we produce polyethene and we write that ethene in brackets. So let's do it for propene. If we have propene monomers and they undergo addition polymerization, we form polypropene. And addition polymerization only produces one product, just the one, okay? And to summarize, alkenes are the monomers in addition polymerization because they open up um, to uh, they open up to join together um, and we get a nice little polymer and it's awesome. Um, so let's just summarize. Um, addition polymerization, alkenes are the monomers, short chain monomers are joined, and the polymer is the only product. Next, we're going to go over some condensation polymerization reactions. And this one, two monomers with two functional groups join together to produce larger polymers as well as a small molecule byproduct, such as water. So condensation polymerization produces two products, addition pol polymerization produces one product. The simplest condensation polymers are produced from two monomers with two of the same functional group on each monomer. Um, okay, um, so that is um, the simplest type of condensation polymerization. Um, so let's go over amino acids. They are organic, organic compounds that have two different functional groups. So an amine group, which is NH2, and a carboxyl group, which you'll remember from carboxylic acids, C double bond OH. 
And in a polymerization reaction, amino acids can be combined by condensation polymerization to give a polypeptide plus water. So the polypeptide is the polymer in that reaction. Okay, so to finish off, we are going to be going over protein and DNA, and we are going to run through this. It's going to be a hypercram on these two types of um, molecules. It's really fun. This is. It's really. I really enjoy it when like biology and chemistry overlap a little bit. So let's go over um, some amino, some proteins. Um, hyper learning. It's going to be great. So. Um, let us dive, let's dive in. It's going to be so great. It's going to be so great. So, um, amino acids, they are what build up proteins and they bond together to produce polypeptides. And these polypeptides are a protein's primary structure. The bonds between the amino acids are called peptide links and they form between the amine and carboxyl groups in the amino acids. So polypeptide. Then we have the secondary structure, which is when a primary protein folds into a structure and the most common structures are alpha helix and beta pleated sheets and if we remember what are the bonds formed they are peptide links so in the primary structure we form peptide links the primary structure then folds to give an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet next we have the tertiary structure which is when a single polypeptide has multiple secondary structures so let's let's review quickly what we've covered the primary structure of a protein is the chain of amino acids they are the amino acids are joined by peptide links and the primary structure um, of the primary structure are also called polypeptides. So common secondary structures, do you remember them? It's an alpha helix and a beta pleated sheet. Amazing. And sometimes we even get a quaternary structure, which is um, when, ter when tertiary protein structures join together to form a larger protein. So many proteins in the body have these structures, primary to quaternary, and some perform very important roles such as enzymes, hemoglobin, and antibodies, three important examples of proteins. Um, so enzymes catalyze reactions, hemoglobin is what um, carries oxygen around the body, and antibodies are part of the immune system. Okay, next we're gonna go over some, we're gonna go over DNA, another important biological polymer. It's a very large molecule that's important for life, and DNA produces the genetic structures used in development, functioning and reproducing of living organisms and viruses. Most DNA molecules are made up of two polymer chains in the form of a double helix. Um, so what is the role of DNA? Let's consolidate that. The role of DNA is to encode genetic instructions. The polymers, so DNA is a polymer and it's made up from monomers called nucleotides. Each nucleotide has one of the four following nitrogenous bases. Nitrogenous just means containing nitrogen. And those four bases are adenine A, thiamine T, cytosine C and guanine G. And the nucleotides join together to form two strands. Those two strands twist around each other to form a double helix. Um, not a single helix, a double helix. And remember, there are four types of nitrogenous base, cytosine, adenine, thiamine, and guanine. Nucleotides can only bond with specific nucleotides on the other strand of the helix, so A can only bond with T, and C can only bond with G. Um, so, true or false about DNA? DNA is made, is made up of polymers called nucleotides. Uh-uh, that's false. They're made up of monomers called nucleotides. DNA is a large molecule that's important for life. That's true. DNA is made of two polymer chains arranged in a double helix. <laughs> we know that's true. And DNA encodes genetic instructions. Yes, it does. Okay, question to consolidate. Which nucleotide does cytosine pair with? It's G. So C goes with G and A goes with T. Uh, amazing. Okay, that was a very quick run through of um, proteins and DNA and uh, fun fast-paced hyperlearning environment. I hope that was useful. Um, I hope this episode has been useful. Please give us some feedback and let us know what you thought of it. I hope it was a useful run through of all the organic chemistry topics that you need to know for uh, GCSE chemistry. Um, if you want some more of these episodes, let us know and we, we can make some more. Um, we want to provide you with the best learning resources that we can. Um, as ever, thank you so much for joining on this episode. If you have exams coming up, best of luck in them. Um, and good luck. You've got this. Uh, and I'll catch you on the next episode. Bye, everyone.